Let's study 9th standard ICSE biology chapter 7, respiration in plants. Respiration is the catabolic process of releasing energy from simple sugar like glucose for carrying out life processes. Glucose is the fuel of the cells. The energy stored in it has to be released through a few chemical reactions, through metabolism. And the energy released is used for our day-to-day -day activities, for our survival. Now in this process, since there is breakdown of compounds, it is called catabolic process because it results in the reduction in the body weight of an organism. The opposite is an anabolic process which results in the increase in body weight, for example photosynthesis, where food is manufactured. So let's have a brief overview of this process. The first step is glycolysis, which happens in the absence of oxygen. It happens in the cytoplasm of a cell, any cell, plant cell, animal cell, microbe cell, where glucose is broken down into pyruvic acid. So that's the first step. Pyruvic acid is also called pyruvate. And the second step is a further breakdown of pyruvic acid. And there are three main parts which can be used here. Usually we have aerobic respiration also called oxybiotic respiration which results in the Krebs cycle. It happens in the mitochondria and the end products are CO2 and water. And the energy released is stored in the form of ATP molecules adenosine triphosphate which is used for our daily activities. ATP is the energy currency of our cells. If glucose was the, let's say, the fixed deposit full of energy, but if you want to use it, we can't use it directly. If you go shopping, first we will have to break the fixed deposit. It will be credited to our bank account. Then we will remove the cash or use the debit card to do shopping. Similarly, here the glucose has to be broken down and the energy stored in ATP and then whenever we need energy, the energy of the ATP is used directly. So that is the energy currency of the cell. It's a very important give reason. And notice that in this reaction, ATP is not created. It was already present in the body. It's just that the energy released is absorbed by this molecule and stored for future use. How does that happen will be explained shortly. But as I said that this was an aerobic process. What if it is an anaerobic process? environment where there's a lack of oxygen then it results in a, in a state called oxygen debt where there's a deficiency of oxygen for example when you're exercising vigorously or you're running very fast then you do breathe faster than usual and yet it may not be enough to create sufficient energy then the muscle cells will do something called anaerobic respiration which will result in the formation of lactic acid and of course some energy is released now this is not very efficient the number of ATP molecules produced, if I can use that word here, will be far less compared to the ATP molecules produced here. In fact, one mole of glucose produces 38 ATP molecules rich with energy. But hey, in emergency, any energy might be a difference between life and death. So this is what is done. And there's a theory that this lactic acid being poisonous accumulates in the muscle cells due to which we get fatigued or tired after a lot of exercise. And then we have to rest so that it can be converted into CO2 in the presence of oxygen. Nevertheless, since this happens in animals, we won't study this in the current chapter. This will be a chapter, this will be a part of another chapter called respiration in animals. Then does anaerobic respiration happen in plants? Yes, it does. And that is called fermentation or anoxybiotic respiration without oxygen. It can even happen in microbe cells like yeast where the pyruvic acid is broken down into ethyl alcohol that is the usual alcohol in beverages plus CO2 gas is produced and of course some energy is released which is stored in ATP. Again, this will be less efficient compared to the aerobic respiration which happens normally. Uh, however, this may must be enough for yeast because yeast does not have to, does not need a lot of energy. It just lives, grows, reproduces and dies. It doesn't have to uh, do homework and study for which you require a lot of energy. So this is the process leading to the formation of uh, alcoholic be beverages and even in fermentation of uh, food items like in the cooking of uh, idlis and dosas from the batter. 
and even in the baking of bread and cakes. Notice that the CO2 produced here is the cause for the bubbles you see in the idli batter or in the bread dough and when you heat it or cook it, the CO2 releases leaving behind pores which makes the bread or the cake very soft. And unfortunately, the some alcohol produced is also evaporated, so there is no alcohol left in the bread or the cake. So now that we know the difference between glycolysis and Krebs cycle and aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration, we are now ready to understand how energy is stored in ATP. If you look at this diagram, you will notice that glucose is broken down into CO2 and H2O, the end products of respiration, aerobic respiration, that is the Krebs cycle, and the energy released is partially given out in the form of heat energy, so that's lost to the atmosphere, and the other part is stored. We already have adenosine diphosphate molecules in our body. They are like rechargeable batteries. So whenever there is energy available to be stored, the ADP and inorganic phosphate particles in our body, they combine to form ADP. And in that process, they have now stored a lot of energy. And whenever this charged battery needs to be used, it can decompose back into the phosphate and the ADP and the energy is released to be used in work. That's how ATP acts like a currency of the cell which is an important give reason and that's the definition of respiration here. Here we have differentiate between glycolysis and Krebs cycle. Location is different and the end products are different. And remember that the equations I showed was a very simplified version. The actual process is very long and complicated and each breakdown is due to a particular enzyme which we don't have to learn in school level. Here we also learn the difference between anabolic and catabolic processes which are opposite to each other. Now let's understand the difference between respiration and burning or combustion because in both cases energy is being released from, fuel, from some fuel and oxygen is also required. However, this is a series of various chemical steps whereas combustion is a single step, burning, it's simple. This is carried out by enzymes whereas here we need to provide an ignition temperature or some heat to start the burning process. This is a biochemical process whereas this is a physicochemical process because even non-living things can burn. Here the energy is liberated partially uh, in the form of heat and the other is saved or stored in ATP. Here all the energy is liberated as heat and light. This is a cellular process and this is a non-cellular process. Now the entire plant respires. In fact, even in animals or even in human beings, we don't say that we respire only through nose and lungs and mouth. That is actually breathing, which is a part of respiration. The actual cellular respiration takes place in each and every cell of our body because all the cells will have to release energy as they want to use energy. But talking about plants right now, yes, even here, the, the, all the parts will do respiration during day and night both. Respiration happens at night as well as during the day. Yes, during the day photosynthesis happens, but that doesn't mean that the respiration will stop. During the day too, plants require ATP energy. So th that means during the day, photosynthesis and respiration happens simultaneously. During photosynthesis, the plants are giving out oxygen and during respiration, the plants are giving out carbon dioxide. But the rate of photosynthesis is far greater than the rate of respiration. So overall, if you see, plants indeed purify the air. They give out a lot of oxygen compared to the carbon dioxide which they give out. But for respiration, they do require oxygen. And there are three inlets for oxygen. They don't have a nose, but they do have stomata in the leaves, tiny pores. Lenticels in stem, again tiny pores, but lenticels can do not close even at night, whereas stomata close at night because they have guard cells. And through the entire general surface of the roots. That is why uh, we plough the soil before uh, growing crops or plants in it. Because if you plough or till the soil, then it creates tiny air spaces around soil particles and provides a source of oxygen for the roots. Otherwise, the roots would die. That is why waterlogged soil or compact soil will not allow crops to grow in them. The aerobic respiration net equation is glucose plus 6 oxygen molecules gives you 6 carbon dioxide molecules plus 6 molecules of water plus 38 ATP which is chemical energy plus heat energy also which is lost to the atmosphere. It's called oxybiotic respiration obviously because oxygen is used. What about anoxybiotic respiration? Well the equation for that is glucose which will here notice no oxygen is required here ethanol that is ethyl alcohol plus co2 yes and 2 atp that's it compared to 38 atp this is very less and this process is called fermentation 
in animals this reaction doesn't take place so their co2 is not produced in fact lactic acid is produced but um, that you'll study in the animal respiration chapter so once again if you want to differentiate between aerobic and anaerobic this proceeds in the presence of oxygen absence of oxygen complete breakdown of glucose ultimately co2 is left here it's incomplete because ethanol is left and ethanol could be further broken down through other processes and the products are different notice co2 is produced here as well the energy is liberated is far more compared to anaerobic respiration and occurs normally throughout life but occurs temporarily for short periods in plants mention that because in fungi and bacteria it's normal anaerobic respiration is normal for them they don't need oxygen to survive many of them and now let's do some experiments with respiration here in this figure if you notice we've got two beakers and we've got soda lime in one of them and in the other we just have we also we have soda lime here also but here we have dead beans and here we have germinating beans notice that the water level has risen more in this tube connected to a flask connect uh, compared to this tube connected to the b flask what could be the reason behind it well the conclusion is that the germinating beans are doing respiration that is why they are using up all the oxygen available they are giving out carbon dioxide which is being absorbed by soda lime so the volume of air inside is decreasing there's a partial vacuum being created due to which the external air pressure now being in excess will force this liquid up into this tube on the other hand here we have dead beans and they are on wet cotton wool and antiseptic as well because we don't even want some germs like bacteria growing inside otherwise they would do respiration so these dead beans won't do any respiration and by the way they died perhaps because of boiling them so there will be no rise in water because no oxygen is being used no co2 is being released hence this is called a control setup this is the experimental setup and this is the control where the condition under study is missing that is germination is missing out here so it's called control we can't just do the experiment set, uh, experimental setup and uh, come to a conclusion because we need to be sure that the cause of this is indeed germination and not something else so by having everything else same except for one thing we are sure that that one thing only is responsible for the observation however you may notice some of the water rising up what could be the reason behind it think about it well um, the air inside here already has some co2 it's 0.04 percent of air does have co2 so when that is absorbed by soda line there is a slight partial vacuum created so slightly the external air pressure will push the water into the tube up to a small height soda lime is actually a combination of caustic soda and slate lime that's called soda lime so caustic soda is sodium hydroxide and slate lime is calcium hydroxide that's a mixture of that so in experiments we have to learn the aim of the experiment the conclusion or inference the precautions taken here for example you have to use antiseptic and the observation what is the control such questions will be asked based on experiments the definitions are given here next experiment let's prove that co2 is released during germination or during respiration so again we've got a control with boiled beans antiseptic of course to prevent any germs from respiring here and soaked beans so they will germinate after some time just tilt just open the cap and tilt the flask into a test tube filled with lime water now co2 is a very heavy gas compared to air so even though you can't see it you can imagine the co2 gas flowing into the test tube and settling at the bottom and whenever co2 reacts with lime water it turns it milky because insoluble calcium carbonate is formed this observation is not given by this boiled beans flask this proves that germinating seeds do respiration and release carbon dioxide there is an alternative method of the same experiment so we have this flask filled with germinating seeds and this is this entire setup here we have a air suction pump which will suck in air from here so obviously air will be sucked in from here the air sucked in from here goes to the delivery tube and it passes through KOAH solution because potassium hydroxide again it absorbs all the CO2 and the rest of the air continues their journey because they are being sucked by this end now this air when again passed through lime water it won't turn milky because there is no CO2 left all the CO2 was absorbed by KOH so this was just to make sure that CO2 free air 
will enter this flask. By the way, the air has oxygen, so germinating seeds will use the oxygen. They will produce the carbon dioxide and that can be proved by the fact that this lime water turns milky. I know it's brown in color here, maybe it's a, a, a chocolate milkshake being produced here, uh, but practically it would be white in color and then the air continues its journey. So conclusively it is proven here that germinating seeds indeed produce CO2. Otherwise why is this lime water milky? All the CO2 of the natural air was already absorbed by this as proven by this lime water. So we are now sure that CO2 is released by germinating seeds. But what about plants, living plants? Do they also release carbon dioxide? Well, yes, they do. As you can see, there is a bell jar and there is wax applied at its base to make it totally airproof. No air should be able to enter in or exit. So there is one precaution to be taken. Again, there is an air suction pump here. That means air will be sucked in from here. Let the air pass through soda line, which will absorb all the carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide free air, which is confirmed by the fact that the lime water does not turn milky. That CO2 free air now enters a bell jar. The plant will obviously use the oxygen and do respiration and uh, it will give out carbon dioxide. And this can be proved by the fact that here the lime water will turn milky. So from where did the carbon dioxide go come? Obviously from the plant. The plant has uh, done respiration. But there is a, a very important precaution to be taken here. Can you guess what it is? Well, it would be to cover this bell jar with a black paper or a black cloth or do this entire experiment in darkness. If this is exposed to sunlight, then sun rays will fall on the leaves. They will do photosynthesis. They will use up all the carbon dioxide. Then how will this lime water turn milky? So we have to prevent photosynthesis here to make respiration crystal clear. Next, what's the evidence that heat is also produced during respiration? Okay, now this can be a little tricky, so pay attention. We've got two flasks here. Um, here we have germinating seeds, here we have dead seeds. Put the thermometers in them. You will notice the temperature rises in this. So this proves that germinating seeds doing respiration do produce heat energy. Next. Let's prove that sometimes anaerobic respiration can also happen in germinating seeds. Yes, if some seeds don't get oxygen, they won't die. They can still survive. They can do anaerobic respiration. For example, uh, fill this test tube and the beaker entirely with mercury. Mercury is a very heavy liquid. Its density is 13.6 gram per centimeter cube. So these seeds will float on top of it. Notice there is no air here. Absolutely no air, no water, just pure mercury. So will the seeds die? without doing any respiration well after some time you will notice that some gas is being collected out here and the mercury is being pushed down and out into the beaker what is this gas here well just introduce a potassium hydroxide stick which will rise up rise up and the potassium hydroxide once it rises here will absorb all the co2 gas because you know koh absorbs co2 and the mercury level will rise once again because of the external air pressure so this proves that CO2 gas was released, but who produced it? Definitely the germinating seeds, even without oxygen. This shows anaerobic respiration in germinating seeds. Make sure that you've uh, removed the, the seed cover, the seed coat of the germinating seeds, which will help in a quick diffusion of gases through it. And the experiment will be uh, done quickly. Next, let's understand the difference between photosynthesis and respiration. This happens only in the presence of chlorophyll. This can happen in all living cells. In the presence of light can occur at all times during day and night both uses co2 and water uses oxygen and glucose oxygen is the end product and co2 is the end product light energy is converted into chemical energy and chemical into heat and chemical energy atp energy gain in weight so it's a anabolic process constructive process results in weight loss so it's a catabolic process destructive process next what's the difference between respiration in plants and in animals in this chapter, we have studied only plants. Animals will study in detail in another chapter. Well, there are three points of difference. First, in plants, there is no gaseous transport. The respiratory gases simply diffuse in and out of all the cells. In animals, on the other hand, there is blood involved. The blood will absorb the oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin and they will deliver it to all the cells and the tissues and they will also absorb the CO2 waste product from the cells and release it into the lungs. Whereas in plants, there is no such blood to transport respiratory gases. It happens automatically through diffusion. Second difference is, as far as anaerobic respiration is concerned, plants produce ethanol and CO2, but animals produce only lactic acid. Third point is, in plants, the respiration, aerobic respiration, produces little heat. Whereas in animals, aerobic respiration produces comparatively more heat. Note one thing, if we would have talked about anaerobic respiration, it would be opposite. Because in plants, 
anaerobic respiration produces more heat compared to the anaerobic respiration in animals. So, finally, a question. Is it safe to sleep under a tree at night? You know, at night photosynthesis isn't taking place, so they will do only respiration, so they will release CO2, so will you suffocate? So tell me, when you sleep in your house and you have a family member, maybe three or six, or any number of family members, all of you are not doing respiration at night, all of you are releasing CO2, do you suffocate? No, you don't. So how will you suffocate under a tree? Especially in an open environment where air can easily flow. No, that's not the reason why we should not sleep under a tree. It's absolutely safe. CO2 is not even toxic. The reason why you should not sleep under a tree is because there might be uh, insects or spiders or snakes. So it's quite dangerous. And uh, worst of all, it's possible that the birds like pigeons may poop on your face, which could be quite irritating. Hi students, this is AJ Sir. If you like this video, press the like button. If you would like to enroll for my online test series or online lectures, email me or message me on Instagram. Check the description for more information.